I'm Brian Russell. Welcome back to class. Today I want to model for you a grammatical analysis. I'm going to walk through Psalm verses, or chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, and I want to show you how it's done. Now to follow along, have your own Hebrew Bible in front of you, so you can stop this video and look at your Bible. You perhaps want to grab a couple of extra English translations. Uh, you can also use Bible Gateway and set up kind of a multi- version look at Bible Gateway and make sure you also have your Arnold Choi book so you can follow along with me. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, what you're looking at here is accordance and if you don't have this tool it is okay. Some of you may have a different electronic tool. This is accordance and so I'm able to bring up the Hebrew text and then I've selected the ESV and the NRSV. I do recommend that you use a couple of English translations along with your Hebrew Bible simply so you can see how different English translations are translating the Hebrew. Because what we're looking for with grammatical analysis isn't simply the parsing of certain words. So it doesn't, grammatical analysis isn't calling a verb a call stem perfect. It's looking at a call stem perfect and, and, and talking about what's the force in the sentence of the call, what's the force significance in the sentence that we have a perfect. So let's go ahead and get started. If you look at Psalm 1, it starts off with the word ashray. And what we have here, you may notice the sere yod ending, is we have a construct noun, also this makaif, the, the horizontal line here, indicates that these words are connected. So this is a, uh, a, a bound form, which indicates that ha-ish, the second word, is a, in a, is a genitive that's modifying ashre. And so this is literally, most you know, so you can see the translations, blessed is the man, but literally this is a noun that means blessedness. Uh, ashray has to do with the state of being blessed. So that's, that's why we, the English translations have blessed, but it's literally the blessedness of or the fortune of. And we have the man. So this is a genitive. Uh, again, Cook Homestead terminology is bound form, but the bound form indicates a genitive. And so you want to go to the Arnold Choi book and make sure you become acquainted with the table of contents here. That's going to help you. And we can see genitive R in 2.2. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to that. And again, we have this whole idea of bl the blessedness of the man. What does that mean? And here, once we get to the genitive, we have various categories. I have an older version, so this, I believe, is just possession. Uh, and they don't even have the possessed category, I think, in the updated one. But possession would be... Um, the blessedness belonging to the man. Now, that obviously works pretty well. Um, another option as you go down, and by the way, the way that Arnold Choi is organized, the most common use of a particular category here, genitive, is going to be the first one, and then they, as they move through, they become uh, less and less common. So uh, oftentimes the first one or the first couple will be the best choice, but you do want to review to see if there's other options. This also could be an example of a specification, whereas um, 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 it's with the idea that blessed with respect to the man. Now that doesn't make as much sense in this case, and so most likely we, we would want to go with possession here. So go back and look at your Hebrew. When in doubt, you want to compare the Hebrew with English translation to see if you can make sense. Now, let's keep going through here. So, blessed, the blessedness of the man, or blessed is the man, asher. Uh, this isn't the same as this word. This is our relative pronoun. We're not going to do anything with this. Remember, in grammatical analysis, we're going to analyze nouns, verbs, and prepositional phrases for now. You can go ahead and say, if you have a little bit more advanced knowledge of Hebrew, go ahead and say more, but that's that's kind of the minimum we're going to look at. So this introduces a relative phrase, so a clause. So blessed is the man who, lo is not, and we have halak, walk, who does not walk. Okay. Now, what's the parsing on halak? Now, some of you ought to be able to do that by sight. That's one of uh, your vocabulary words. Halak is... <clears throat> 
a third masculine singular call perfect verb from halak, and this is exactly how you would have, have learned the verb. So to analyze halak, we're going to need to ask ourselves, what's the, what's the function of the call binion or stem, and what's the force of the perfect? So let's start off with the stem uh, first of all. And notice the translations, who does, who walks not, or who do, do not follow. So again, notice NRSV much more interpretive with the meaning of the word walks, whereas the ESV, as you might expect, takes uh, kind of translates more uh, literally. All right, let's go and look at the call stem. We'll look that up. Again, go back to your table of contents, but you'll find the call stem covered in 3.1.1. Now, the call stem is your basic stem. Again, you can review the Hebrew uh, review chapter where I lay out all the stems. You can look at the appendix in the back of Arnold Choi that gives you a nice chart that shows you the various um, verb stems or binions. But the call stem essentially functions in two ways. It's used of basic action, feintive verbs, which is a fancy way for action verbs, or stative verbs, which are... Uh, describe a quality and in English stative verbs sound more like adjectives so like if you see the example right here Pharaoh's heart was heavy you know, heavy is just an adjective in English so uh, let's go back and look at our word walks is that a action verb or state it, it, you're right it's a state that's a feintive so the call here is feintive now we just need to look up the force of the perfect so let's look up perfect and the perfect tense is going to be, if you go to the table of contents, you will discover that it's 3.2.1. And here we are, the perfect. Now, the perfect has some various options. Completed action, uh, in the sense that um, uh, from a view of the whole, this action is complete. Um, again, it's not, this, this isn't a state of here. Experience is a feintive verb denoting a state of mind, like I know. Uh, prophetic typically is a way of when you use a perfect, it's looking into the future. This isn't um, blessed is the man who will walk. And then proverbial, denoting actions, events, or facts that are not time conditioned. So let's go back and look at the use of halak here. And would you say this is. Uh, completed action, proverbial, experience, yeah, and, and you can argue for two things. This could just be completed. Blessed is the man who does not walk. So it's like a picture of some person who doesn't walk uh, in, the in the counsel of the wicked, or could, you might take this as proverbial, whereas Psalm 1, the idea would be that Psalm 1 is giving general truth that will be true for all time. So you could have a couple of options here, and it looks like uh, both ESV and NRSV are essentially agreeing. It could be completed. It could be proverbial. I would probably tend to go with the proverbial here because this does seem to be kind of general, generically true uh, uh, advice or statement that would be true for any person um, in any place in any time. Okay, and then we keep moving along here. We get does not walk, and then we have notice in... Um, uh, the way it's the first verse is structured, we have three additional verbs. We're going to have, uh, well, we have parallel structure. We, so we have does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So we have preposition bait followed by a noun that is in the bound state that then indicates that we have a, a, a genitive here. We'll come back and look at that. Then we have the same structure. We have another prepositional phrase with a bait in bound state to sinners. Then we have the verb, again, expressed in the negative, does not stand. And then we have a third parallel structure. Again, the preposition bait, a noun, and a, a, a noun in the bound state with its genitive. And then we, again, we have a perfect verb in the negative. So we're going to notice that probably our analysis will be the same for each one of these phrases but let's back up and you know take a decision on this so let's look we have in the counsel of the wicked 
So for grammar, we have to do two things. First, we have a prepositional phrase indicated by the preposition bait. And the object of the preposition is this noun phrase that has a bound form with a genitive. So the object of the preposition is the noun phrase, counsel of wicked. Okay, well, let's start with the bait. Um, what does it, um, let's look, and to look up the prepositions, you're going to want to, to uh, go to 4.1 in the Arnold Choi book. Preposition, sorry about that. And the preposition section is going to be in alphabetical order, so we need to go down to bait. There it is. And so we have spatial, which is the basic one, which is location. So it does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So that's a possibility there. It, it just, it's the sphere in which the verb, the action occurs. Uh, temporal would be time. Circumstantial, um, so it would be something like, um, blessed is the person who does not walk by the counsel of the wicked. So that could be maybe an instrumental use. So there's some different options here. But again, in each case, you want to go through and select the best option. Now, probably most generically, this is talking about the location, does not walk in the council. You could also argue that maybe it's instrumentation or means. So those would be your two best options. And again, you can list multiple options. Uh, and do notice that um, it's a little harder to see the use of the prepositional phrases the way that the NRSV translates it, but the good old ESV is a piece of cake that we can do. We see in there indicating that. So that would be an example of a spatial use of the prepositional bait or maybe the, inst or the, the instrumental use or the agency use of the prepositional bait. Okay. Now, what about counsel of the wicked? What's the force of those prepositional phrases? Now, let's go back to, or not prepositional phrase, what's the, what's the force of that genitive? Sorry that I misspoke. Let's go back to genitive again. And the genitive is going to be all the way to the Beginning again, Let's check it out here on the 2.2. Head. All right, the various genitives again, possessed. Um, so if it was possess, which is the very first one, possession, it would be in the council belonging to the wicked. So that would probably be possible again, or the wicked's counsel. But it can also be um, a type of counsel in this case. So it's describing um, the genitive is a quality or attribute of the bound noun. So in this case, wicked is an adjective. And so that adjective could be modeling. So it does not walk in wicked advice. So notice this could be attributive or it could be possessive, and you can take an exegetical decision later. So what's important in grammatical analysis isn't just trying to get the right answer. It's to see possibilities so that when you do your exegetical work, you're not laser focused on one thing. And then you can decide within the sentence if that's better as possession or um, attributive. I'm not asking you to take a final decision when you do grammatical analysis. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to, to look at possibilities and then describe those possibilities. Okay, And so we have it, the counsel of the wicked. Um, they, these probably, the, by the way they're translating, would probably indicate possession. Now, when you go ahead and analyze these next three parallel phrases, the way we analyze the beginning, halak, is going to work the same. Ahmad's another call perfect. There's no reason, given the parallel structures, not to um, uh, understand it in the same manner. The same with the verb yashav, another call perfect. And then we have similar structures in terms of the um, prepositional phrases with the baits. Probably all of these are spatial. And the bound forms are likely all attributive 
or possessions uh, in these cases. So that's verse one. Again, if it went too fast, I invite you to back it up and go through it again slowly and uh, notice how I describe the words and how I'm using Arnold Choi. Okay, let's go to verse two. Verse two starts off with particles. We're not necessarily analyzing these right now. But this is a strong disjunctive force. When you put a key with an eme, um, you, you probably learned key is um, if or when, and eme is if. So, it's, so this, this, when you put these together, you get the idea of but. So this is a strong contrast between verse 1 and verse 2. And verse 2 starts off with but, be torat, Adonai. Again, I'm pronouncing Yahweh as Adonai as it's pointed. So in the law of Yahweh, in the law of the Lord. Okay, why am I saying the law? It's because Yahweh is a proper name. This is a bound noun. Notice the patak tav from the lexical form Torah, the law of the Lord. Okay. So what's the force of the bait? Again, go back to Arnold Choi, and we'll look at 4.1 again. And we have to go back to the baits. And again, probably spatial. It's, it's, it's going to be his delight is in the metaphorical sphere of... Yahweh's law. Right? So, in the law of the Lord. In, there's their in. So, that's probably spatial use of the bait. And then, what's the phrase? The Torah of the Lord. Let me raise this up a little bit. Okay, so we have a bound form with the genitive. So, let's look at the genitives. But you can almost guess. We've already been doing the, what, the law of the Lord. That would be the, a couple of things. There's probably two options here for this particular use of um, this genitive of, of, of the Lord. Let's go take a look at it. Okay, can we, have, we could have possession, the law belonging to the Lord. Okay, so when you go through your book, you want to notice that there's the law of the Lord. And so that would be probably a genitive of possession. So you want to notice that. So it's the law belonging to the Lord. Let's go back to our text again, and you can see again that um, both texts um, agree on that. And then we have the word his delight. So this his delight, this particle talking about the blessed person, is in the light of the in the law of the Lord. This is a verbless clause. There's no verb right here. And so when you have a noun, uh, no verb, you're allowed to use the word is. And so this is just a nominative. This particular noun functioning as the subject of a, um, just essentially a verbless clause. And then the second half, we have and, bait, torato, in his law. Then we get a verb. He meditates daily and at night, or day and night. Okay, so let's see the easy part here at the end. We have um, uh, two words that function um, as um, uh, essentially the kind of adverbially as daily and nightly. So it gives the extent of the meditation there. But okay, then let's go back to the beginning. And in his law, okay, so there's our bait. What's the force of this prepositional phrase? Again, probably spatial again. He meditates in or on um, the law of the Lord. And now let's look do one more verb here before we wrap up this video. We have ye ye from the word haga for meditate. <clears throat> and this is actually kind of making a sound, right? So this is like an audible sound. The person's pondering carefully the words, saying the words over and over again, letting them percolate down into their, into their being. 
So this is an imperfect. We've mostly seen perfects. Now we have an imperfect third masculine singular uh, call verb from haga. So now we got to look up something different. We still got a call. So is this a state? Is meditating an action or a state? Because remember when we when we look at the call, go back up up to here. Call is 3.1.1. Again, when in doubt, go to your table of contents. Again, it's, it's either action, a feantive, or a state. In this case, meditate would be a feantive. And then we also need to look at the perfect, which is going to be 3.2.2 for the imperfect. Now, imperfect verbs can be incomplete in the tense of future. They can be customary, something that continually happens or regularly happens. They can be progressive, uh, contingent, and you can take a look at um, your, your book. But let's go through this and take a decision on it. What's the kind of the force here? On his law, he meditates. This sounds a lot like the customary use. Again, go have a look at that again. The customary denotes an action occurring regularly or customarily. This is, again, it's the idea of it's almost proverbial in a sense, just like we had in uh, for the in the verbs in 1-1. One, one. So this would be the customary use of the imperfect. Okay, again, that's a way to walk through the Hebrew text. Again, you'd want to be writing this up. But this is a way how you can do a grammatical analysis, and I wanted to show you how you can go between um, English translations, and notice they're all essentially translating the same. Um, you can, and by the way, you can approximate these parallel columns um, by using um, the blueletterbible.com or by using biblegateway.com and bringing up several different uh, English translations at the same time to compare with your Hebrew. If you have any questions, post them. I hope this helps. Again, I'm Brian Russell. I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve you, and I'll see you next time.